Hi, everyone. Welcome to McGill Cares, a weekly webcast series addressing a wide variety of topics to support family and informal caregivers. I'm Claire Webster, a former caregiver who became a certified Alzheimer care consultant and founder of the McGill University Dementia Education Program. I work with a dynamic team of leading healthcare professionals to oversee this program, which include Dr. Jose Moret from the Division of Geriatric Medicine, Dr. Serge Gauthier, McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging, and Dr. Gerald Fried, McGill Steinberg Center for Simulation and Interactive Learning. Today's webcast is made possible thanks to the Zeller Family Foundation. So today we will be, we, we will be discussing <laughs> healthy aging to stay strong and prevent dementia. And I'm so thrilled to have my wonderful colleague, Dr. Jose Moret, as my guest today. Dr. Moret is professor and director of geriatric medicine at the McGill Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, McGill University Health Center, and Jewish General Hospital. In addition to being the academic lead of the McGill Dementia Education Program, he is co-director of the Quebec Network for Research on Aging and past president of the Canadian Geriatric Society. He conducts research on the organization of services for older adults and on nutrition and metabolism as they pertain to healthy and fragile aging. Welcome, Dr. Moret. Hi, Claire. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Very pleased to be here. Yeah. So happy to have you here and um, so many questions to ask you. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll begin with, um, you know, when we talk about you seeing patients at your clinic, what are some of the most common health concerns that you're seeing on a regular basis in addition to cognitive decline? Yes, uh, um, other than con cognitive decline, uh, the issues to do with uh, mobility, safe walking, maintain autonomy, capacity to remain uh, in control of our lives, being able to uh, uh, do our own uh, um, house chores, organize our lives is of great concern. People uh, in Quebec and throughout the world, what they want is to remain on their own, own homes. And for that, you need brain capacity, but as well as physical capacity in the form of uh, being able to mobilize without much restrictions and, and have a healthy and uh, interactive uh, life with uh, families and friends. And, and uh, it's what makes one uh, go to advanced age and remain happy and, and participatory. Yeah. So when we talk about healthy aging, okay, at what age do we have to really start becoming more conscientious? So as an example, I'm 52, you know, I, you know, I feel like I'm a person that's in good shape, but, you know, I think at times I, I start taking my health for granted. So at what age do we start seeing some physical or cognitive changes and should I be concerned? Well, first, I think we, we, we need to, uh, to uh, be conscious about health uh, from very young age, um, uh, but because we know that uh, through adopting good habits, it will contribute to a, a, a better aging later on. Uh, but it is true that we, we do notice that from uh, performance of, uh, of athletes, you know, after mid thirties, they cannot perform to the same degree as when they were twenties. But in general, we have enough um, body and organ reserve to go to advanced age and still be autonomous because this is what we, we want to is to still be in control of our lives. So though performance starts to decrease after age 30 or so, we are endowed with so much reserve that one can go to very advanced age without difficulties. The problem becomes when uh, due to a subnormal type of aging or the presence of multiple chronic diseases, which have an impact on this capacity to live autonomously, this is where uh, we need to pay even more attention. Uh, and, and uh, you, you know, adopting the healthy lifestyles contribute to maintain our body reserves to the maximum, though through the aging phenomenon, we expect some decrease, but still enough to be independent. And this is what we aim for. 
So, um, you know, a lot, a big question that uh, a lot of people ask is really, what's the difference between normal aging versus not normal aging when it pertains to cognitive ability? Like I'm always looking around the house for my glasses. I keep losing my keys, you know, and then sometimes like I get nervous, like how come I can't remember? So what would be the difference? It seems as if um, at any age, uh, we have some mild forgetfulness without any specific consequences at all. But after age 50, we become more conscious of it to the point that we start wondering, am I having something? Mm -hmm. But forgetting where you put your glasses, where you put your keys, uh, where you put certain uh, objects, it's common at any age. Um, So the problem becomes uh, at another level, uh, I would would say a pathological level, a severe level is, is when there is consequences in our lives so that uh, um, the, the forgetfulness uh, leads to consequences. And this is where we, we, it's more than just normal aging because through the aging process, uh, it is true that our capacity to treat information may be slowed down, but this is compensated by the experience of life. We have seen the circumstances uh, many times before, so we know how to react properly. And in fact, we take as one ages, we take much more balanced decisions than when we are, you know, an adolescent, for example. So uh, even though the speed at which we treat information slows down, uh, it doesn't have any specific impact whatsoever, you know, um, as long as it doesn't reach the, the pathological level that we see with diseases such as Alzheimer's disease, obviously. So the, the decrease on cognitive capacity as one ages is not troublesome whatsoever. And is it true that also that stress can play a role in terms of our like cognitive, like, you know, there are certain times of our life, like, like for example, caregivers who are, have to think and do so many different things. You know, I, I remember going through that in my forties where I became so forgetful. I couldn't remember anything unless I wrote it down. So does stress play a role also in, in terms of our cognitive ability? Definitely. Definitely. It's well recognized that in order to uh, store information, you need to be attentive. And if you are stressed, you don't have that capacity to concentrate. So information was never stored to be used after. And and once we are depressed or anxious, we have many ideas flying through our ads. And and this prevents one from concentrating and and really uh, uh, retain the information properly. I see that many, many times. And once the cause of the stress is uh, overcome, controlled, then they can function once again. It's, it's, it's quite common in our practice as geriatricians, as physicians, uh, to encounter uh, people who feel they, they, they have lost memory, but in fact, what they are going through is a period of stress or depression. So when we discuss cognitive decline, like what would be the average age that we, you know, that you would see people starting to experience, I would say more of a dementia related cognitive decline. Is there there a certain age? Well, without saying a certain age, for sure, as one ages, the risk goes up and it goes up to about 90 of of age or so. After 90, usually the risk decreases once again. It's a kind of a survival effect. Uh, To give you uh, uh, some figures, Persons by age 65, only two to 3% of them might have a cognitive impairment that would meet criteria for dementia. When you reach 85 years of age, talking about 25 to 30% that might reach enough memory impairment to be called as suffering from dementia. Uh, and, and again, by, by age 90, the percentage goes up, but because they have accumulated the diagnosis before, the new onset of dementia goes down after age 90. Um, so this to say that that uh, it's not the age per se, uh, but increased risk as one ages. Consequence to aging effect, yes, certainly, but also the cumulative effect of many uh, uh, risk factors uh, and uh, lifestyle that we have adopted that makes the, the risk of developing dementia higher. Uh, the cumulative effect of many lifestyle lifestyle factors that one has adopted. You know, there is great heterogeneity amongst the older population. Some age very healthy, others uh, not. 
um, you know, there is components that are due to uh, genetic background, you know, families in which there is diabetes, heart disease, uh, it predisposes to have more problems later on in life. Mm -hmm. However, as one ages, depending how your, your adopted uh, lifestyle is, with a routine that is healthy, then you can expect the, the, the memory impairment and the dementia to, to uh, not to be so, so present as one ages. And we know that, uh, you know, probably uh, uh, a good uh, uh, 50, 60 percent of dementia can be controlled if throughout life, mm -hmm. starting at any age. It's why I didn't say before that there's a specific age from which you need to start paying attention. It has, is, is through the life course, uh, you, you can prevent uh, appearance of dementia or delay it to the maximum. So let's talk about some myths regarding dementia, okay? That okay. many people are concerned about, okay? So myths and true or false, okay? Okay, I'll do so, my best. All right, so here's a quote. If Alzheimer's disease runs in my family, I will get it no matter what. True this is false. false. Uh, this is false, why? Because each of us, um, uh, though we have some genetic uh, commonalities with our uh, family, we, we also are responsible for our, our own lives. And, and we know that those who are more physically active, that have a, 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 a healthy weight, uh, that do not have bad habits such as excessive drinking or, uh, or smoking, the risk associated with having Alzheimer's will go down in a substantial way. Uh, so that because my father, my mother has Alzheimer's, doesn't mean that I will have it. Because uh, the factors behind Alzheimer's are very complex and many are due to lifestyle habits that we can control. So uh, it's why uh, it's not, uh, it's a false to say, so, that because someone in the family had Alzheimer's, that I will have it too. Um, okay. Yeah. If I live long enough, I will get Alzheimer's disease. No, this is not true either. This is false. Uh, reason being that if it would be true, let's say everyone would be demented by age 100. And we know that it's not the case, uh, especially because I just told you after age 90, if you never had dementia before, you will not, not acquire it, uh, probably never, you know. So it is false, uh, it, though the reality is as one ages, the risk increases to age about 90 or so. But again, it's a risk. It's not, uh, to be positive, only 30%, 25 to 30% of persons above 80 do have dementia. So 70% don't have it. Let's talk about uh, the the other way. So I don't need to worry about Alzheimer's disease because no one in my family has it. False also, <laughs> because you are responsible for your own life uh, so that um, due to circumstances and, and again, the way you, you live your own life, you can increase or decrease that risk. So as one ages, we, we, we are called to be more active in our maintenance of health, cognitively as well as physically. Uh, because as the physiological reserves, the reserves of the different organs, the brain included, but the musculature, the articulations, the heart and lungs, uh, reserves decreases as one ages, we have to be more proactive to maintain that, these capacities, you know, uh, uh, what the right, uh, right life uh, uh, habits that we should have developed since childhood. And I can tell you uh, an extremely important factor to prevent dementia appearing later on is by going to school and receive education. What uh, the more years of education you have, the more you protect yourself from having dementia. So you see how much factors of our own life choices one makes can uh, uh, help us not to develop dementia. Okay, so leading into my next question then, so what is your prescription for healthy aging? So let's start with nutrition. 
okay, I think indeed nutrition is important. We hear a lot about diets and different types of diets. But my first point here is to adopt a, a nutrition in which there is three meals a day, plus or minus a small snack later in the evening, not to eat anything in between the meals. Because, um, because uh, we know that, that eating uh, in between meals is a cause of gaining weight, especially if we eat all kinds of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, free calories instead of nutrition dense. So three meals a day plus or minus a snack. Then in, in the choice of meals, uh, the emphasis is to have more vegetables, more, more, um, more nuts, more whole grains, um, and less of red meat. You know, traditionally, we never had so much access to high-valued um, uh, high meat as we do have now. And we are eating in excess of what we, one needs, and there is consequences to that. So a type of diet then includes a lot more place for having vegetables in our, in our meals, but it is important also to have proteins from poultry, from fish. Fish is extraordinary, uh, both in terms of having protein content, but also because of uh, the type of um, fatty acids. They are rich in omega-3 fatty acids, especially, you know, talking about tuna, salmon, mackerel, herring, you know, all, all of these um, contain oils, natural oils that prevents our cholesterol to raise and cause cardiovascular disease. A type of diet that has been shown to be healthy is the Mediterranean diet, mm -hmm. in which it is much more of these vegetables than of red meat, along with some olive oil that, as a monosaturated fat, also prevents cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, to, to rise and cause problems in our body. So this is for, for the, uh, the, my recommendation for, for nutrition, which is never skip a meal. Eat regularly but don't eat cookies and free calories in between. You are doing a so-called uh, uh, fast, um, prolonged fast diet. You know, you don't eat for about a day. We don't need that. If you really, between your meals, you don't eat anything else, you're already doing your fast, fast, you know, period. Mm -hmm. It's my uh, suggestions. So, you know, when we talk about physical exercise, you know, I mean, I think many of us who end up who are in our 50s, for example, like I played tennis my whole life and now I'm suffering from like my shoulder. I could barely lift it. And most of the time other people have knee replacements, you know, back. But, you know, if you look at physical exercise, what would be your recommendation in terms of activities that we could do for a long time with minimal yes. injury to ourselves? Uh, this is a very good point, Claire, because uh, we put a lot of emphasis in what we call moderate to vigorous physical activity, and people would tend to adopt this type of lifestyle. They spend many more hours after that in a very sedentary uh, state. So they become sedentary in between these intense periods, which is not good either. It is as if all the benefit of the intense exercise is lost by the prolonged hours of sedentarity. So, for physical activity, first thing is avoid sedentarity. You know, more than two hours seated, it, it, you have to do something to compensate, avoid that. So what we are learning more and more these days is what we call the value of the light physical activity. Because light physical activity that uh, is done over many more hours rather, rather than 30 minutes of intense exercise facilitates the role of insulin in the body, uh, which is... Uh, a very good thing to prevent diabetes from appearing, you know. So um, having a more continuous type of exercise uh, is definitely associated with less heart disease, uh, uh, better physical capacity over time, uh, and it is recommended. And this is accessible to anyone. So like walking. So you mean something like walking? walking. Yes. You know, there is this uh, question of doing more than 1,000 uh, steps a day, which is fantastic. And the more you do, the better it is. And you don't need to run for that. Uh, but I can tell you, studies showing uh, that with 7,000 to 7,500 steps a day, which is accessible to any person, you know, uh, it decreases dementia. 
decreases dementia even in those who have a kind of predisposition because of some of their uh, genetic makeup, okay? Um, and, you know, think that every 10 minutes of walking is a thousand steps. So you can easily uh, doing, you know, uh, 30 minutes is 3,000 steps. It contributes to that, that uh, aim of reaching 10,000 if you want. But even in the house, if you're doing some house chores, if you're doing some gardening, if you're doing some cleaning, this and that, makes you do your steps that you need. So think about every day to do more of these light physical activities rather than spending time sitting because the time seated, this is detrimental for health. Hmm. I never really thought of household chores as being a good <laughs> exercise. I mean, do it like the vacuuming. Yes, yes. But it's true. I never really thought of that. Let's That's, do it positively yeah. instead yeah. of doing it as a core, right? <laughs> <laughs> and what about um, social recreational activities? I mean, you mentioned earlier about the importance of education, you know, learning new things. But what would be some other, you know, like is are like, for instance, card games, um, like social games, like what would be good for the brain? Well, definitely, uh, whenever there is an interaction with other human beings, it's, it's a good stimulation for our brain because there is uh, many faculties being implicated in such an exchange between human persons, you know, uh, in terms of understanding what the other one is saying, doing analysis of the content and proposing a, a, a logic reply. All of this takes a, a huge, a huge uh, areas of the brain uh, uh, involvement, you know, uh, but in, in general, uh, any activity that you dedicate to learn something new is a big stimulation to the brain for the same reasons. It highlights many other areas of the brain than just a very passive watching TV, as an example. So it's time, especially with the COVID pandemic, you know, to learn something else, being a new language, being music, uh, any kind, drawing, um, and you know, it's recognized that the learning and the efforts uh, to learn something new stimulates the brain and prevents dementia. On our on our website, we have an amazing uh, booklet, an activity booklet that uh, that was created by four McGill students from the School of Physical and Occupational Therapy that's available to people to download that has so many incredible activities, especially as the winter months are coming. So I really encourage people to, to use that booklet. So what about the role of sleep? Can you tell us how, what is the... Yes, I mean, it's an indispensable way of remaining healthy. I mean, the way our um, body is organized in, it, in its time, protected time, uh, to recover from the continuous insults of the day. Uh, this involves mainly the brain uh, because during our sleep, our brain is active ordering all the information that he received for the last 24 hours or so. Um, so it is important that uh, we sleep, I would say, depending on age, something around seven hours of sleep um, and and make an effort to follow a routine. Because if you lack sleep, it's common knowledge. Uh, you're gonna be tired. Your capacity to concentrate will be decreased. You probably will be more irritable. And there is a, a, a many consequences of that sort that makes one less performant. So sleep is essential. It's part of uh, a, a good lifestyle uh, that we need to adopt, all of us. Um, and and uh, so, we have to be careful of protecting our time of sleep and follow a routine before going to bed. Do it at regular hours. Do not watch TV in bed because the, the light that is coming from the screen is very stimulatory to the brain, you know? Um, and also sometimes the content. If you, it's common knowledge. If you look at a scary movie, you're gonna have more difficulty falling asleep. <laughs> uh, um, so, these are advices that we can find everywhere, but difficult for us to adopt because by our human uh, nature, we tend to uh, know what we should do, but we don't do it. So this recipe or prescription that you just gave us was really also when I think of it, it really is a, the secret recipe to keeping our heart healthy at the same time, which is one of the most important organs of our body, right? Yes. So. 
So maybe if you can talk about briefly, I mean, we, we, I did a webcast on the correlation between cardiovascular health and dementia, but I think what's important if you could outline is the impact that our heart health has on, on our cognitive health. This is true, uh, uh, Claire, because of the importance of maintaining a good circulation to every organ of the body. And what was often um, overlooked is, is the brain itself. Uh, you know, when I, I was a, a resident uh, in the learning process of becoming a physician, we would insist in the importance of the good circulation, high blood pressure control, etc., to protect the heart, to protect the kidneys, even to protect your vision. But we would never talk about the brain. Now we know how much is important to have a good circulation to the brain so that uh, our brain cells will receive the, the, um, the nutrients, the oxygen that they need to perform well. We know, for example, following a stroke where certain areas of the brain are destroyed, this changes the networking of the brain, all vascular clinical circulation and heart attacks and, and strokes, you know. So I want to talk about COVID because now there are so many people who are at home, isolated, can't access resources, support, um, you know, and so there's a lot of, you know, caregivers caring for a loved one at home. You know, falls are a significant issue among seniors uh, for both the individuals who have cognitive and non-cognitive issues. So what can people do at home to safe proof themselves from falling and then avoid having to go to the hospital? You are, you are right to point, out, to point out these aspects because amongst all the uh, population uh, uh, age groups, it is the older persons that have suffered the most from the COVID pandemic. Uh, you know, the confinement have caused them to become isolated, uh, reduced in a substantial way their mobility, and, and you know, this, uh, they are forced to become sedentary and there is consequences. And these consequences are more obvious in those who are more advanced age because they have less physical reserves, you know. Um, so we have seen a, an increase in falls, an increase in confusion as well because of isolation, but because of their sedentarity, they are forced to be confined. And uh, the, the approach here is, is, in fact, that the community as a whole becomes more sensitive and contributes so, so that the older person is less isolated, the older person can still be allowed to do certain things. During the first wave of the pandemic, we were very restricted. We have learned from these, um, uh, these problems now, and we are understanding that a certain degree of, uh, of uh, presence is allowed if we on, one is using masks, if, if one using a, a distancing properly, but not to isolate people. And I feel sorry that many of the community activities that can still be done under uh, good uh, sanitary measures, as opposed to doing nothing, because there is consequences to that. Um, there is programs being developed, including those from medical students of McGill University, to prevent the isolation from taking place. And this is very encouraging to see the, the, uh, the junior generation, you know, the young people mm -hmm. involved for the betterment of older people. So how can people safe proof their ho homes? Like how, how, like to ensure that they don't fall? Would, you know, you mentioned to me before about decluttering, like yes. what could people do? I mean, the falls is a complex field in which there is intrinsic factors. So factors that is within the person, but also the uh, environment as well, you know. Um, so in the environment, uh, it is true that too many uh, rugs and 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 clutter due to the, too many furniture um, uh, can precipitate uh, precipitate faults. Uh, also, the older persons who are dependent on devices and decided not to use them, you know, uh, either because they have lost uh, memory, cognitive impairment or because of their own will of not doing it because they're a bit stubborn, it leads to more falls. If, if a device has been recommended, it's because there was a justification for it. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. So always use the, your, your walker or your cane not to have a fall. Um, obviously, surfaces that are more, more um, slippery, wet, all of this contributes to fall as well, and you have to be sensitive. 
if something uh, liquid falls on the ground, we have to make sure to, mm -hmm. to really dry it uh, so that we will not uh, slip on it. So coming uh, out of the shower, making sure there's always a bath mat, for yes, example. Yes, um, and there is even for the shower, there is measures one need to take if our dexterity, flexibility, our strength is decreased so that we can use uh, things such as extended bench to go in and out of, of the, the, the bathtub, which is associated with many falls, and also do things more slowly. Sometimes oh, we are too impulsive. Uh, we think that we can still uh, hold our body in one leg, which uh, as one ages can be a more, much more com difficult task, you know. So all of this needs to be reinforced for safety purpose, because unfortunately falls are frequent, and those who fall about uh, 25, 30% will fall again on the same year because the intrinsic causes of the fall remains. Um, I am developing an exercise program uh, based on literature so that soon it's gonna be made available so people can follow this exercise and we hope to prevent falls in the future. Exercise is key to maintain flexibility, balance, uh, strength, endurance, et cetera. So, so that, um, you know, the, we need to follow. As you mentioned at the beginning, as one ages, we need to be more proactive on our own maintenance of health. Voila. You know, I think we, the good point that you had, you mentioned is just to slow down. I mean, I, I've fallen because I'm rushing. I'm rushing to grab my phone. I'm rushing to open the door. I'm, I'm you know, especially with stairs, if you're wearing, you know, you're not wearing slippers, there's a runners, but the times that I've fallen is always because I've been rushing. And then you say to yourself, why am I rushing? Yes. You know, if you miss yeah. that call, you can call somebody back, but you're right. Just, you know, reacting and getting up too quickly is, is oftentimes leads to falls. And um, it, it becomes so, even more, more important if you, because due to aging and diseases, uh, your balance is, is not as, as good. So if you rush, then you put yourself into high risk of falling. Yes. So I have one last question for you, which is an important one. You know, now with COVID, people are afraid to leave their home. They're afraid to go to the hospital. They, they don't have access to doctors. Um, and, you know, but they're really afraid. They're afraid to go to the hospital or to a medical clinic. Yeah. What would you say to people with regards to being afraid to go see a doctor? And also what would be certain symptoms that they should show that they must seek medical attention for? Yeah, okay. I, I mean... It is true that uh, with advanced age, um, there, there, there is increased risk to have more severe type of COVID, let's say. But let's be uh, realistic. Let's, let's look at our environment these days as compared with the spring, for example, where people are wearing masks. The hospitals are more uh, in position to uh, uh, receive patients uh, because professionals have now equipment. The, the sanitary measures are put in place everywhere. And it becomes more detrimental if you are having some symptoms that would that should be addressed by a medical or a, a healthcare professional and you neglect to do that because you are afraid. It's not logic. So consider that the system have now adopted measures to prevent um, infectious spread of the infection and you need to deal with your problems. Let's say that you are having fever that you are uh, having a uh, shortness of breath. I mean, you cannot let this uh, pass uh, as if nothing is happening because there will be further consequences, more severe than if you would go to the hospital. You know, uh, so people have to be um, conscious that there is pros and cons and being too afraid prevents them from benefiting from help they, they should have. Thank you so much, Jose. Oh, Dr. Moret, I'm so used to being friends. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, but fine. thank you so much for, for taking the time and, and being with us today and sharing this really important information and advice. Thank you. I mean, uh, it, time flies. I didn't realize that uh, we, we have finished the time allowed. It was a real <laughs> pleasure. I, I hope that what I have given as information will help people to benefit more from their own health and age well. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And um, next week on Wednesday, November 11th, I have a very, very special guest, Susan Weiner, the author of Resilience. She'll be talking about finding courage in the face of hardship. 
She's a two-time cancer survivor, a TEDx alum, best-selling author, as well as an educator and therapist. And Ms. Wiener will share her amazing story and offer her insights about facing difficult times with hope and resilience. This webcast is an initiative of the McGill Dementia Education Program, which is funded by private donations. Once again, I would like to thank the Zeller Family Foundation for supporting today's webcast. If you'd like to make a contribution to our program or for more information, please visit us at mcgill.ca slash dementia. And if you have specific topics or questions that you would like to address, you can email us at dementia at mcgill.ca. Until next week, take good care of yourselves and of your loved ones. And thank you for watching. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.